in order to describe time-dependent electromagnetic phenomena, such as the induction of an electric field by a time-changing magnetic field, or the induction of a magnetic field by a time-changing electric field, requires the complete set of time-dependent Maxwell equations to be considered. The four Maxwell equations are listed here in their most general form, and it may be noted that in addition to the space dependence, all four electromagnetic fields have now a time dependence. Also, the charge density rho has a time dependence, so has the current density j. Of particular importance in understanding the time dependent phenomena associated with electromagnetism is the coupling between electric and magnetic field that is inherent to the last two equations. Reading Faraday's law from the back, one can see that the time differentiation of the magnetic field and taking the negative of that gives a rotational electric field. Similarly, looking at Ampere's law, the last of the four equations, one can see that Maxwell's addition, the time differential of the electric field, gives a rotational magnetic field, H. These last two equations, thus, detail the coupling of the electric and magnetic fields, and they are crucial for discussing time-dependent electromagnetism. The coupling of the electric and the magnetic field was discovered by Michael Faraday in 1831. Michael Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction is demonstrated here using an ammeter and a one-loop coil of wire, a 10-loop coil of wire and a 100-loop coil of wire. The coils are connected to the circuit and then a bar magnet is pushed through and pulled out. It is apparent that the magnitude of the observed current depends on the number of loops. One loop, tiny current, 100 loops, a large current. The magnitude of the observed current also depends on the speed of the motion. This is because it is the change with time of the magnetic flux through the coil that determines the magnitude of this current. The direction of the induced current changes if the magnet is turned around and the magnetic poles are swapped. The magnitude of the induced current also depends on the change in area through which the magnetic flux lines penetrate. In this case, the cross-sectional area of all three coils is the same and it does not change. Therefore, the observed induced current only depends on the number of windings, the speed with which the magnet is inserted or retracted, and the orientation of the bar magnet. A very similar experiment was carried out in 1831 by Michael Faraday. Although Faraday had very little formal education, he became one of the most influential scientists of his time, making contributions to both chemistry and physics. His experimental work in electromagnetics formed the basis for James Clerk Maxwell's theoretical description. This cartoon illustrates the four possibilities that occur when a bar magnet is moved through a coil. There are four possibilities because as the bar magnet moves in, the magnetic field in the coil becomes stronger. As the bar magnet moves out, it becomes weaker. In addition, the north pole can be moved in or out and the south pole can be moved in or out. So there are four possibilities and they are all accounted for by Faraday's law of induction. The minus sign in Faraday's law of induction represents Lenz's rule, namely the fact that the induced field direction, B induced, is always antiparallel to the direction of the field change delta B. In other words, the induced current in the coil is directed such that the associated induced magnetic field opposes the change of the magnetic flux. As the bar magnet moves with the north pole forward into the coil, the magnetic field at the position of the coil increases, 
a delta B is added to it. It changes, it increases with time. This induces a current in the wire of the coil that is downward. And associated with this current is an induced magnetic field that points to the right. This can be verified using the right hand. So the induced field is opposed to the change delta B. Illustrated underneath is the situation where the north pole of the bar magnet is moved out of the coil. Now the magnetic field inside the coil decreases and the delta B points to the right. Induced is a current that is upward so that the induced magnetic field inside the coil is pointing to the left. Again induced field is opposed to the change delta B in agreement with Lenz's rule. The two cartoons on the right consider the situation where the south pole of the bar magnet is moved out and then into the coil. In this case the magnetic field inside the coil is directed to the right and the change delta B can be pointing to the left as the south pole is moved out because the magnetic field decreases in magnitude or the delta B points to the right in the same direction as the magnetic field B inside the coil. This occurs when the south pole moves into the coil. In both cases, in agreement with Lenz's rule, the induced magnetic field associated with the current induced in the coil is opposed to the change delta B. The polarities in the drawings indicate where positive charges accumulate at the plus sign and where they diminish at the minus sign. This convention is not consistent throughout the literature. Sometimes in such drawings the polarities are indicated for an equivalent DC circuit that is driven by a battery. This photo shows the original coils of Michael Faraday. Maybe coils that he used in 1831. Two coils of copper wire are wound about an iron torus and the insulation is provided by cotton that is held together with string. As we do today, Faraday observed that switching on and off DC currents in the left coil, for example, briefly creates electric currents in the right coil. Hi, I've got a rare earth magnet here and an aluminium tube. If I drop the magnet, it just falls under gravity. If I drop it into the aluminium tube, here it goes, it takes much longer. Look, here it is. Let's count this in seconds. One, two, three, four, five seconds it takes for it to come out. That's because in the aluminium eddy currents are created that are such that the induced magnetic field associated with them opposes the motion of the rare earth magnet. One, two, three, four, five. The effect is explained here. Illustrated is a rare earth magnet with a north pole pointing upward that falls through a tube. Above the rare earth magnet the magnetic field becomes weaker, so the change of the field points downward. This induces concentrical electrical currents in the tube that run anti-clockwise looking from the top. Associated with these currents are induced magnetic fields. Two field lines are indicated in purple. The circulation of these field lines in the plane of the paper is anti-clockwise on the left and clockwise on the right. That means the induced magnetic field on the inside of the tube points upward. It points in the opposite direction as the change delta B. Above the magnet, the actual magnetic field of the rare earth magnet and the induced magnetic field B induced point in the same direction. Therefore, there is an attractive force pointing upward on the magnet. Below the rare earth magnet, the magnetic field strength increases with time and the change with time delta B points upward. Therefore, the induced magnetic field shown again in purple has to be downward. This is consistent with the induced eddy currents, which on the right in the plane are anti-clockwise and on the left are clockwise. 
since actual magnetic field in red and induced magnetic field shown in purple point in opposite directions, the magnet experiences a repulsive force that is also directed upward. The upward forces on the magnet decelerate the magnet so that it spends much more time inside the tube than would be expected for a free fall. The interaction between an original magnetic field and an induced magnetic field is effectively used in eddy current brakes, an example for a high-speed train as shown in the photograph. A metallic disc attached to the wheel moves at high speed through an electromagnet that might produce a magnetic field that is directed downward as indicated here in green. In this cartoon on the right, eddy currents are induced that are clockwise and on the left they are anticlockwise. The repulsive and attractive forces between the induced magnetic fields and the original magnetic field have components that decelerate the motion of the disk D. What is now different compared to the static fields? Both charge density and current density are now time dependent. Charge distributions are still the source of electric fields and the first Maxwell equation diversion of D equals rho V holds. So does divergence of B equals zero. There is no change here since no magnetic monopoles exist the time dependence is of no consequence for the Gauss law of magnetism. The other two Maxwell equations change significantly. Let's first look at Ampere's law. Ampere's law tells us how magnetic fields are created. One possibility is a stationary current. A stationary current has a rotational static magnetic field. Furthermore, a changing electric field generates a magnetic field. These are the two possibilities of creating a magnetic field. They are both included in Ampere's law. Ampere's law also has to be consistent with the static case, for which the partial differentiation d on dt equals zero. So that it reads the curl of h, the curl of the magnetic field strength, is equal to the sum of current density plus the partial differentiation with respect to time of the electric flux density. Importantly, Ampere's law includes both the magnetic field and the electric field. One depends on the other. This has important consequences and we say magnetic and electric field are coupled. We also note that the term d on dt of d, which is charge per time and area, has the dimension of current density. It is therefore often referred to as displacement current density. This term was originally introduced on theoretical grounds by Maxwell and the term displacement current goes back to him. What motivated Maxwell to add an additional term to the experimental Ampere's law without having any experimental evidence for it at the time? That is explained here. Maxwell noted an inconsistency of the experimental laws as they were known at the time and that inconsistency is best understood by looking at Ampere's law in its integral form, shown here the closed path integral of the magnetic field strength H equals the current that penetrates through the surface that is limited by the contour of the path. Without the inclusion of the term d on dt of d, the situation illustrated on the right would be inconsistent. The sketch shows an electric current I that flows onto a parallel plate capacitor so that positive charges build up on the left plate and an electric field D is created between the plates since the charges accumulating on the left plate are taken away from the right plate. So the left plate has a charge Q and the right plate has a charge minus Q. Without Maxwell's addition, Ampere's law would not be true for this situation. Compare the plane surface and the bulging surface. 
both the plane and the bulging surface have the same contour, which is the ring on which the blue path differential dl is indicated. Going on a closed path around this contour gives the same integral h dl. Both surfaces, the plane surface and the bulging surface, have the same closed path integral h dl. However, they are very different surfaces. In the case of the plane surface, the current I passes through it before the left parallel plate, whereas the bulging surface is stretched out so that it reaches over the plate. This means that no current passes through the bulging surface. The right hand side of the equation, the right hand side of Ampere's law is equal to zero. In contrast for the plane surface, there is a finite positive current going through the surface and the right hand side of the equation is finite. This is a contradiction. Both surfaces have the same contour, giving the same closed path integral of the magnetic field H, but the bulge surface has no current I flowing through it. Maxwell's addition resolves this problem and achieves consistency. Maxwell realized that the magnetic field curls around a stationary electric current, as observed by Ampere, but he expected that it would also curl around an electric field that changes with time. This is illustrated in the sketch for the same configuration as discussed a moment ago. On the left of the two plates, the current I creates a magnetic field that curls about the current. The current builds up an electric field between the two plates, positive charges on the left and negative charges on the right. That means the electric flux D between those plates increases with time and as a consequence of that a magnetic field curls about that flux vector. And on the right, because charges are taken away from the right plate, a current flows and a magnetic field curls around that current. Maxwell's great insight and theoretical prediction of the displacement current in 1862 completed the four Maxwell equations and made them consistent. The complete Ampere's law now reads curl of magnetic field strength H equals current density J plus d on dt, the partial differentiation of the electric flux density D. This differential form of Ampere's law can be converted into the integral form by taking a surface integral on both sides. Taking advantage of Stokes' theorem on the left hand side of this equation converts that surface integral into a closed path integral. What we obtain is the integral form of Ampere's law, which relates the path integral of the magnetic field over a closed contour C to the sum of the free current and the displacement current through the surface that is limited by this contour. In general terms, this situation is illustrated in the sketch on the right. A current flows through a bound surface and the field lines of the resulting magnetic field H are indicated on that surface. Maxwell's realization that a time-changing electric field creates a magnetic field might have been motivated by the fact that at the time it was well known that the inverse is true, namely that a time-changing magnetic field creates a curling electric field. We know this as Faraday's law. In differential form it reads the curl of electric field strength E is equal to the negative partial time differentiation of the magnetic flux density B. The two cartoons visualize this statement. If the time change of the magnetic field is larger than zero, the electric field curls in an anti-clockwise sense, left-handed sense, as shown on the left. In contrast, if the change of the magnetic field is negative, then the resulting electric field curls in a right-handed sense, as shown on the right. The minus sign in the equation 
is the manifestation of Lenz's rule, ensuring that the build-up of the electric field opposes the original change of the magnetic field. Without the minus sign, a self-amplication would occur and energy would not be conserved. The minus sign thus has fundamental importance and guarantees self-consistency of the Maxwell equations. As illustrated at the beginning of this video, the validity of Faraday's law can be readily demonstrated with experiments. The experimental facts are also contained in the differential form of Faraday's law. We can see this if we define a surface S and integrate both sides of the Maxwell equation over that surface. Finally, we apply Stokes' theorem to the left-hand side and obtain the integral form of Faraday's law. We may imagine that the closed contour of our surface S is a conducting wire with ends 1 and 2. The two ends are physically separated so that we can measure a voltage difference, but they are so close so that we can theoretically assume that we have a closed contour. If we further imagine that this essentially closed loop is penetrated by a magnetic field that changes with time, we can apply Faraday's law and see if it agrees with experiment. Assuming that the magnetic flux density is directed upward, and increases in magnitude with time, we expect that a current should flow from 2 to 1. In agreement with Lenz's rule, a current flow in this direction will counteract the increase of the magnetic field. Therefore, the potential at point 2 has to be larger than the potential at point 1, and the potential difference between 2 and 1 is positive. Since potential difference is defined as the negative closed path integral along the contour, in this case this path integral is negative. The left hand side of Faraday's law is therefore negative. The right hand side of Faraday's law is also negative because we assumed initially a positive change of flux density with time. The surface integral is therefore also positive and the minus sign in front of it ensures that the right-hand side of Faraday's law is negative. This demonstrates that certainly the directionality of magnetic field change and electric field are correctly represented by Faraday's law. Experimentation confirms that this is also true for the associated magnitudes. Both differential and integral form of Faraday's law represent nature correctly. So far we have assumed that the coil is stationary in space. This however does not have to be the case. The cartoons show that by rotating the coil very different situations occur. On the left many magnetic field lines penetrate through the coil. In the middle it's intermediate whereas on the right not a single magnetic field line penetrates the coil. This has consequences for the induced electric field. The variation of the changing spatial orientation of the conductor coil can be taken into account by introducing the concept of magnetic flux. Magnetic flux phi, also time dependent, is the integral over the magnetic flux density B over a defined surface S. In most general terms, the right-hand side of the integral form of Faraday's law thus becomes the negative total time differentiation of this surface integral, the surface integral of flux density over a defined surface S. Both magnetic field and the coil position can change with time. Faraday's law including field and coil change is therefore given by the equation in the red box. The closed path integral over the electric field E is equal to minus the flux differentiation with time. One of the most important applications of Faraday's law is the AC generator, which is illustrated here. For simplicity, only a single rectangular coil of wire is shown that rotates in a static magnetic field. 
The flux density between north and south pole of the two permanent magnets is constant. However, because of the rotation, the magnetic flux through the surface defined by the coil varies with time. This induces an electric field E in the coil that also varies with time and the associated current changes direction as the coil turns. The current directions indicated are for the moment in time where the right hand wire of the anti-clockwise rotating coil moves upward. 90 degrees later in the upright position the induced current is momentarily zero before it changes direction. It is clear that this arrangement induces an alternating AC current. This graph visualizes the correlation between the rotation angle theta of the coil and the voltage measured across the coil. In this cross-sectional view, a horizontal orientation of the coil corresponds to a zero voltage and zero current in the coil, whereas at 90 degrees, voltage and current are maximal. This simulation illustrates how Faraday's induction law can be applied to create a three-phase generator. First it is shown how magnetic flux that changes with time can induce alternating electric fields in conductors that move electrons to the left or to the right. Multiplying the number of wires and arranging the wire so that it can take advantage of cylindrical symmetry gives a much more effective device. The permanent dipole magnet is replaced by a static electromagnet and the poles are arranged that the magnetic field lines intercept the wire at many places along the cylinder. This results in a single phase alternating voltage. Adding a second and a third coil appropriately spaced between the loops of the first coil gives the three-phase voltage output.